Good morning, friends. Once again, I want to welcome anybody who might be visiting us here at Granite Bay today. We're very thankful that you're here. Our message today is titled, Through the Roof. And it's based upon a story that made such a big impression on the apostles that you find the story recorded in the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The story can be found, and we'll be principally studying this experience from Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, but you'll also find it in Luke 5, 17, and Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. It's called the story of the paralytic. It's a wonderful story that is just full of, I think, rich lessons for us to consider. You know, during the war, some of the most important individuals are the stretcher bearers. They, they carry the wounded soldiers that are on the battlefield on these leaders. Here's actually a picture of some Canadian soldiers during World War I. And there, I grabbed that picture because it's similar to our Bible story where you've got five involved, four men carrying one. And um, they really brave a lot of obstacles. They go on sometimes not just after a battle, but in the midst of a battle. Battles sometimes take for days. And these combat medics go out there under fire and they have to sometimes give quick medical treatment, just sort of this hospital field medical treatment to people. They put them on the leaders and they have to carry them off the battlefield. Sometimes they've got a red cross on their back or on their arm. <laughs> in, in some battles they said that it just made them a target because it would demoralize the troops when they started shooting their medics. They knew that there was no one to help them when they were injured. And then they would have the courage to, you know, take them off the field to the field hospital and go back and get more. And they are some of the unsung heroes of the wars are these stretcher bearers. Well, in the story we're looking at today, some of the unsung heroes are the stretcher bearers, these people who brought their friend to Jesus. And we read about that they came to him carrying somebody. Now we'll get to that in a minute, but I'd like to examine just some of the first few verses and look at the, the words more carefully. Look again at Mark chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And again he entered Capernaum. And after some days it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. Wouldn't you like to know that you can invite your friends to a house where Jesus is in the house. What is the church? It's called the household of God. Sometimes we call this the house of God. What were they doing in this house? They gathered together to study the word. Why did the crowds come? Because Jesus was in the house. You know, don't we all wish that we had a church where we're not embarrassed to invite people? Because Jesus is in the house. And if we only knew Jesus was in the house, everybody would want to be there. Now the Bible says that um, they longed for his presence. The crowds would mob him. They would just want to touch him, to listen to him. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if Jesus is in the house, people are going to want to be with you. Christians should be attractive. Isn't that what the Bible says? So let your light shine that people might see and be glorifying God. The Lord wants us to be attractive people. And that doesn't just mean you should obviously take care of your personal grooming. What that means is that you ought to have a disposition so that people want to be with you because you're positive, because you get that joy, because you're happy, and it attracts people. Now what did he do when he had the crowd? The next section you can see in verse 2, I'm just going to the second part of, the, of uh, chapter 2. It says, he preached the word to them. Now I've got a, you've heard the expression, what came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first? Jesus preaching because there was a crowd or the crowd coming because Jesus preached? Did Jesus preach the word because there was a crowd or was there a crowd because Jesus preached the word? I think they came because he preached the word. You know, years ago when I first moved back to Sacramento with Karen and we started pastoring the Sacramento Central Church, I'll, I'll tell you, it was a little intimidating because I was coming immediately from pastoring a church that sat a hundred people. 
now you're moving into a church that, you know, seats 1,100 people. You're moving from a church that's way out in the country where you got, you know, the same person that plays the piano is also the, the deaconess and the Sabbath school teacher and it's like, you know, these little churches, one person does, has 12 positions and you move into this, you know, big city church where you have all these professionals, it's a little intimidating. And at the time I came, attendance was way down. I mean, we sometimes had 120 people there. I remember one of the deacons said, Doug, we're glad you're coming. He said, we can throw grenades in the church right now and not hurt anybody Sabbath morning. So um, I talked to a friend who was a pastor, one of the associates, and I said, well, well what do we do? <clears throat> he said, in a city this size, he gave me some good advice. He said, in a city this size, there's so many people that are looking for a place where they preach the word. He said, you know, I've been here and lots of pastors have come and gone and they got all these fancy programs and seminars and initiatives and things they do. He said, but if people just know they can bring their friends to a place where the word of God is going to be preached, they'll come and they'll bring their friends. And I thought, that's the best advice I've heard. I'm just going to make it my mission. Of course, I always believe this anyway, but I said, I'm going to make it my mission. Preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Because what changes people, it's not going to be the programs and the machinery and the decorations, though they all have their place. It's not going to be how much money you have. It's going to be the word is what changes people's lives. So the people came because he preached the word, and he preached the word because the people came. John 5.39, Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. These are they that testify of me. The word is all about Christ. In the book Desire of Ages, the author says, in every page, whether history or precept or prophecy, the Old Testament scriptures are irradiated with the glory of the Son of God. So when Jesus was preaching the word, he wasn't just sharing the New Testament because it wasn't written yet. He was taking the Old Testament and showing the gospel even in the scriptures that they had then. And then the story goes on. It says, then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So there was this man and he is paralyzed. His, his condition, the sickness, whatever it was, has just racked his body and the disease is advanced and he is all gnarled up. Um, if you read in the book Desire of Ages, it, it says that his paralysis was connected with a life of sin that had taken its toll and so that he was dying and he was even at the point of decay. And he had heard about Jesus healing the leper, he had heard about the miracles that had taken place in, in Capernaum and he thought, if I could just get to Jesus, I bet he'd heal me. But he's crippled. So he prevailed on his friends that loved him enough and they said, we think you're right, we're going to bring you. And so they brought him, when they heard Jesus was back in the house, they said, we're going to bring our friend to Jesus. You know, I read that um, there's quite a few people, it may be 30% of the people Jesus healed, either their case or they were brought to Jesus by someone else. There's a lot of people that will never be saved unless they are brought to Jesus by someone else. One time a father came to Jesus and said, can you come to my house and heal my daughter? She's too sick to move. Others would bring people to Jesus. Sometimes blind people were led to Jesus. But that reminds us that there's a lot of lost people out there that are never going to find Jesus unless someone else brings them. And sometimes it takes more than one person to bring them. It's the influence of several people that are working upon them that begins to touch their hearts and bring them. Now there's a problem that arrives. They get there, they got there late because they came far, they had to go slow. There was no room. The crowd is all around the door. They're straining to hear every word and the crowd is gathered all around the windows and the necks are craning and heads are in the, the window and I don't know how they could even breathe the stifling air in the house or a lot of people, you have the disciples are in the house and their families are in the house. You know, Peter had a family. He had a wife, he had a mother-in-law. Peter had a family. It says Andrew was there and uh, James and John, you know, maybe lived next door and uh, then you've got the twelve apostles and then you've got, it says there were scribes and Pharisees and lawyers, you read Matthew and you read Mark and it says they're all three and they're all gathered in there so the house is full. They couldn't get through the door, they couldn't get through the window, there was no back door and they had exhausted every 
horizontal option. Now when that happens and you exhaust all of your horizontal options, then you need to just give up because the crowd's in the way, right? What was the problem that prevented them from bringing their friend to Jesus? One of the most important points I want to share today. What was it that prevented them from bringing their friend to Jesus? Was Jesus the problem? Was it the paralysis that was the problem? They couldn't get near Christ because of the crowd, the people. What kind of crowd? It's the crowd around Jesus. Are you telling me the crowd around Jesus can keep people from coming to Jesus? Yes. What is the greatest obstacle to Christianity in the world today? Is it atheists? Now atheists aren't the problem with Christianity. The world mocks Christianity because of the crowd around Christ. Sometimes it's even the crowd around Jesus that keeps people from Jesus. It's people who take the name of Christ that sometimes advertise against Christ. How many times have you heard people say, oh, I wouldn't mind Jesus, but it's the hypocrites. Lord, I like you, but save me from your followers. How many times have you known somebody that says, I don't go to church anymore because of what someone did to me? There was a group, they started to gossip about me or they said something terrible, or if you only knew what the pastor, the deacons, the deaconess, the elder, what they did to me, they took away my position, or just whatever it is. I mean, I've heard all kinds of stories, and some of them are terrible, and they're true. Some are not true. Some are exaggerated. Some are imaginary. It doesn't matter. I want to tell you now, <clears throat> if you were the devil, and you thought you could use people in the church to get a person discouraged with the church so they wouldn't come anymore, would you do it? If you want to be a good devil, if you were going to be the devil, you'd want to be a good one, right? You don't know how to answer that, do you? <laughs> but if you were going to be a good devil, you would try to use professed Christians who were being inconsistent or being unkind to keep people away from the house where Jesus is. Because it is so important that we come together to worship Him. Being part of the body of Christ, being part of the community of Christ is crucial. I can prove to you if you let me take a detour right now that it is essential that you are part of an active church family in your salvation. The idea that you're just going to wander around and say, but I'm spiritual. I don't belong to any church, but I believe in Jesus. You're going to become eccentric and unbalanced if you're not part of a church family. But there's people in the church and they got problems and they're hypocrites. Best place for you to learn love is to be around people that need love. Right? It's not hard to love everybody that's lovable. So I'm warning you, if it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. The devil will get somebody in the church to try to hurt you so that they become an obstacle and a lot of times people cannot see Jesus because they're so preoccupied with a crowd around Jesus. Somebody hurt them. Somebody did something. Someone's been a hypocrite. You can fill in the blank. There's a thousand ways you could fill in the blank about somebody in the church did something to hurt you and they can't get this man to Jesus because of the crowd around Jesus. Amen? I want to make sure that sank in significantly because I want you to plan ahead now and say, all right, Lord, I'm bracing myself. Someday the devil is going to use somebody in the church to eclipse Jesus from my view. And I'm not going to let it happen. Make up your mind. You're not going to let it happen. Okay. Did I make that point? So his friends, they looked down at the paralyzed man and they said, we tried. We're heading home. Is that what they said? No, they persisted. They didn't give up. Instead of looking horizontally at all the problems, can't get through the door, can't get through the back door, can't get through the window, one of them said, well, let's look up. And they looked up to the roof. And they said, you know, there's a back ladder we can get up on the roof. Now, the houses were all built back then so that they had an area in the middle with a deliberate hole 
Sometimes it was slightly elevated so the smoke would get out right through the middle of the house. They had the cooking pit in the middle of the house. It created convection. The heat rising up through brought in the cool air from the windows and from the door and then it would go out through the roof. Sometimes they weren't cooking but it was there and all you had to do is remove the covering and you could, it was made to remove. They had tiles or they had sometimes palm fronds or whatever it was. So they went up on the roof, they moved aside the tiling, they had some ropes or something or the corners of his sleeping bag were long enough where they began to lower him down. Now I, you can just see this. I, I want to see the video of this in heaven. I'm going to ask the angel to play it back. Jesus is in this room, all the scholars and the scribes and the apostles there, he's preaching the word, and they hear this ruckus up on the roof, they can already hear people out the windows and the doors, and pretty soon light begins to stream through because they've moved aside the palms and the tiles and the light is coming through and the dust is falling down in the sunlight and they're going, what in the world? And some people are thinking, how rude, they're disrupting the service. But was Jesus upset? No, he was happy. He was pleased. When he saw their faith, he was pleased. And all of a sudden, in the middle of his sermon, Christ stops and they begin to lower this individual right down in front of Jesus. Something else I want you to notice is his friends recognized an important truth. Their buddy, the paralytic, was not going to get help by being with the crowd outside. He was only going to get the help by being with Christ. We are not saved by second-hand Christianity where you say, I am with a Christian group, I must be a Christian. You do not get credit by being around the people who are around Jesus. You must have a personal encounter with Christ. They knew they needed to get their friend right into the presence of Jesus and they did. And Jesus is happy. So instead of looking around they started looking up and you could say they had a breakthrough. That's what it says. They looked up and they broke through the roof. Maybe you need a breakthrough in your life and you've been looking horizontally and you can't find any answers. How many times have you tried to solve a problem and you work on it for days and weeks and hours and you forget to pray? You think, oh, I didn't pray about it, did I? It's all the time we're always looking horizontally and we got to look up. And what it says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. Do you notice it doesn't say when Jesus saw His faith. When Jesus saw their faith. Whose faith is He seeing? It's the faith of the friends that bring their buddy to Jesus. Now, I don't believe that I'm saved by your faith directly. We all are saved by our faith in Christ. Whenever Jesus healed someone, He said, your faith has made him whole. But others can be healed by your faith as well. People can be saved by your faith. You pray for people that are lost. You pray for people you're studying the Bible with and your faith will make a difference in their salvation. You see what I'm saying? They must eventually have their own personal faith but people can in part be saved by your faith and your prayers and they didn't just pray, they did something. The Lord, I think their faith was seen in works. They thought, I believe Jesus can heal our friend. We're going to work because we believe that. This is a really important point. I just paused and thought everybody would go, hallelujah, you'd have an epiphany, but nobody did. <laughs> you have faith that the lost can be saved? Do you have faith the lost can be saved? They had faith the lost can be saved. So they could have said to their friend, we believe Jesus can heal you. Goodbye, we're going to hear him preach. <laughs> they said, we believe Jesus can heal you, we're going to bring you to Jesus. They then did something about it and they actively got involved. There are people who will be saved because of your active involved, because you're practicing your faith that will not be saved if you do not practically do something. They had faith but they showed their faith. They carried their friend, they tried the door, they tried the window, they tried the roof and finally they got what they were after. When Jesus saw their faith, I need to move along. So here's this man, he's laying in front of Jesus. What do you think his big desire is? If you saw that man all shriveled up and dying and probably didn't smell very good and he's sick, maybe he had a fever, you would think, wow, he's really ill. But when Jesus saw him, he said, there's a person who is struggling with guilt. He saw the sin problem. Most everyone else saw the sickness problem. 
Jesus decided to deal with the real problem, the biggest problem, first. If you've got a person who is terribly sick and dying because of sin, and you only heal their body, and you don't forgive their sin, what have you done for them? You've just prolonged their misery a little bit. To everyone's shock, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that shocked the group for two reasons. One reason they were shocked is they expected Jesus to heal him. He was placed in the presence of Christ. It looked obvious his problem was he's sick, he's paralyzed. He can't even bring himself. Someone else brought him. But Jesus looked beyond that and he saw what the real need was and the man was more than anything, he knew he was sick because of his life of sin. He wanted to know that he was forgiven. Because if you're healthy and lost your whole life, would you prefer that to living a life of sickness and being saved? You know, I'd like to quote something from that book, Desire of Ages, I've referenced twice already in this message. Page 268. Now in words that fell like music on the sufferer's ear, the Savior said, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. The burden of dispel rolls from the sick man's soul. The peace of forgiveness rests upon his spirit and shines out on his countenance. His physical pain is gone and his whole being is transformed. The helpless paralytic is healed. He hasn't felt any healing. The thing that healed him was the forgiveness of sin. The guilty sinner is pardoned. In simple faith he accepts the word of Jesus as boon of new life. He urges no further request but he lays there on his cot in blissful silence too happy for words. The light of heaven irradiates his countenance and the people look with awe on the scene. When Jesus said your sins are forgiven a peace just went over him. He laid there, hasn't moved a muscle. He still looks like he's paralyzed but a peace irradiates went across him that they could see something happened. He was changed. They could see he was changed and he hadn't even been healed yet. When you're saved from your sin, people will notice something's different. Now when Christ said that, it really angered some of the religious leaders because the Bible's pretty clear that God and God only can forgive sin. Well, they're right. Only God can forgive sin. Don't miss that point. Only God can forgive sin. Was Jesus God? The Bible says in the beginning God created. Who created all things? Christ. Everything that was made was made by Him. He is the Word. And only Jehovah can forgive sin. Well, Jesus is Jehovah. Jesus is God. And by the way, does Jesus have less power to forgive sin today? Did He like use it all up between today and 2,000 years ago? Or does He have just as much power to forgive sin today as He had back then? He's, that means that He can forgive us our sin? Can He heal us from our paralysis? It's that simple. He speaks the words, the man believes, a peace comes over him. He was saved by faith in what Christ said. Now, Christ knows what the critics are thinking. And they're saying, God only can forgive sins. And then they're true about that. And He said, but you doubt that I can do this. So, Jesus perceived, I'm in verse 8, Mark 2 verse 8, immediately when Jesus perceived in His spirit that they reasoned thus within Himself, and He said to them, which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? And Jesus said, look, I want you to know that I have the ability to forgive sin. My main reason for being here, the Son of Man has come to heal everyone from their sicknesses? No, he did that, but that wasn't the main reason. He had come to seek and to save the lost. The reason Jesus came was to save us from our sins. Any physical healing and the miracles he did back then, aside from re relieving the suffering, the miracles were to demonstrate his power that he could forgive sin. Why does God prove his supernatural power in prophecy? So you can know that he has power to forgive sin. The bottom line in all the power that we see through the gospel is so you can know that He can forgive sin. Because that's the only thing that will take you from this life to the next life is having your sins forgiven. And then He goes on, He says, but that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Does He still have that power? He said to the paralytic, He turns, He says to the man that's laying there, 
I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, he took up the bed, he obeyed Jesus, and he went out in the presence of them all, so they were all amazed, and they glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this before. You know what I think is one of the most wonderful points in this story is that when the man came to Jesus, he was carried by others on a bed that carried him. When he left Jesus, he still had the bed, but nobody carried him, and the bed didn't carry him. He came through the roof, and he left through the door. You have two natures. You've got the spirit, and you've got the flesh. Before a person comes to Christ, they are carried by the flesh. They go where it goes. They're helpless. But after we come with Christ, do we still have our carnal side? We still have it, but it doesn't carry us. Because Paul says, sin will not have dominion over you. And so after this man spent time with Jesus, he was set free, he took up his bed, he's healed, he goes forth. Were his friends happy? Who was rejoicing the most? This man and then his friends. This is a wonderful story, friends, of uh, salvation and what God does. How through the blood of Christ we can be saved from our sins and set free. The Bible tells us that uh, we might be paralyzed by sin. You might be thinking there's just no way out. But through faith, when Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven, those words are for us. A daughter, your sins are forgiven. And when we receive that by faith, He sets us free. And then He tells us to arise. And the first place we go, we go back to our house to be a witness in our own home. Arise and go to your house. And everybody glorified God. I just love this story because it just talks about persistence, it talks about the power of the Word, it talks about the transformation that God can make in our lives through faith and through His promises, and uh, I'm hoping that it will all be live in our lives today, that it will come to life. Amen?